You're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam. Streaming on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and at DCAUReview.com. Now, here's today's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 111 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your hosts, Cal. With me is my brother and other host of our program, the gentleman that runs our Twitter page. It's Liam. Liam, episode 111, we're continuing with Superman the Animated Series, and boy oh boy do we have a fun one today. Absolutely. Uh, We've uh, talked about it last week, and we've talked about it in previous times. We've talked about the character introduced today, but... Um, this is just one of those quintessential uh, episodes of, of Superman, really any of the DCAU shows that we cover. Um, it's just so much fun, and it introduces a new kind of important character. And as we'll get into throughout the episode, it actually has a pretty big linchpin for a future storyline in one of the other DCAU shows. So, yeah, we are in fact talking about the DCAU debut, easy for me to say. <laughs> of Lobo in The Main Man, Parts 1 and 2. There we go. Um, and uh, yeah, before we get into the the IMDb description for this week's episode and, and, and breaking down our categories, I feel like I felt like we'd be remiss not to not to communicate like I, I don't think it makes much sense for people understand the gravity of what it was having this Lobo character on terrestrial kids television at this time <laughs> um you know this character debuted in the 90s as sort of a tongue-in-cheek response from my recollection to the uh sort of ultra violent wolverine character he was sort of the you know the dc tongue-in-cheek response to that sort of anti-hero mm-hmm. maybe a, a little bit of punisher in there you know violent uh anti-hero cussed a lot lots of blood and gore in his comic uh you know pseudo i don't know if they had actual i know the the comics authority uh, code was still around at that time so i don't know if they had actual cursing in his comic books but he had these sort of pseudo curses uh, in it so it was a very adult oriented comic at the time and uh i think you and I probably were introduced to the character in the Marvel versus DC or DC versus Marvel, depending on your, on uh, which issue. But uh, in that event that happened uh, in the early to mid nineties. So seeing this character, we were, we were already at least somewhat familiar. He was the character that ended up fighting Wolverine in that comic book. Mm -hmm. Um, So we, we had a little bit of familiarity from that, but this character, again, it was a very adult oriented character probably you know would be akin to nowadays having deadpool uh, appear in a in a cartoon um yeah. you know the popularity of a very adult themed adult oriented character debuting in a children's cartoon uh but uh yeah i i think that i think that speaks to the the story and we'll we'll talk in a little bit about the writing of the story and stuff but being able to translate this character into into cartoon form and still Still making it kid friendly was is was quite the feat. Yeah, and doing that while still making it feel authentic to that character, who, as you mentioned, is this sort of ridiculous caricature of, you know, edgy's edgy, you know, Rob Liefeld esque, you know, image comics tough guy, uh, you know, nineteen, you know, late eighties, early nineties, you know, gritty, grungy superhero comics. And somehow uh, uh, adapting him to, as you mentioned, this this children's cartoon, um, but also keeping keeping it still feeling authentic to that character. Uh, it's a it's a tightrope to walk walk, and they do uh, just a great job with it. Absolutely. All right, Liam. Let's get to the uh, Internet Movie Database description synopsis for this week's episode, The Main Man, which of course is a uh, Superman season one, and that debuted originally. Part one debuted on November the ninth, nineteen ninety six, with part two debuting the final week or the following week, eleven sixteen, nineteen ninety six, putting us just at the twenty four year mark this upcoming November. Yeah, and of course, since we have a two-parter, that means I have two synopses to read this week. Oh, yeah. And yeah, this is for The Main Man Parts 1 and 2, which were both written by Paul Dini, uh, both directed by Dan Reba, 
with music by Harvey Cohen and animation by Coco slash Don Yang. And that synopsis reads, the synopses, I should say, reads as such. Superman squares off against the moronic, super powerful space biker mercenary Lobo, who has a bounty hunting contract on the superhero. And the synopsis for part two. Superman and Lobo must join forces to escape being exhibits inside of an alien zoo. Uh, I mean, breaking it down to its, like, studs, that's exactly what both episodes are about. So, uh, <laughs> golf, golf clap for, for our IMDb for this week. But, uh, yeah, Liam, let's, let's jump into our plot, as we always start with here. Uh, so, we are introduced, uh, the cold opening here, we are introduced, and it's interesting, because uh, reading up on this episode, I guess this episode aired... Uh, later in the season but was originally uh, the production order was different because this is the ep- episode uh, we were supposed to be introduced to the space capabilities of the superman uh his his child ro- childhood rocket ship the rocket ship that brought him to earth mm-hmm. uh, being adapted by star labs in order for him to have intergalactic travel, I guess, uh, they modify his, his his spaceship, the one that brought him here to Earth. And, uh, of course, we do see him use that, I believe, in the Brainiac episode, maybe? Mm-hmm. Or there's another episode where that actually aired before this one where they use it for that. But uh, the, anyway, the, so production order was a little bit different. But this is the introduction to that. So And, and that's, that the only reason we point that out is because that's going to be something that not not only is used in this episode, but is going to become a staple in in Superman's uh, arsenal. He uses it to, of course, fly to Argo, and uh, they discover Supergirl, and mm-hmm. uh, several other uh, you know battles that he does in space. It's uh, it's an important part of his uh, is uh, his tool set there. But uh, we quickly learn after that that we are introduced to this character Lobo, who is uh, somewhere out in space attempting to collect a bounty. Uh, some excitement ensues there. He's he runs into the collector sort of uh, haphazardly, and the collector says he's out for Superman. He wants to add the last Kryptonian to his uh, his intergalactic zoo. I think they called it on the IMDb. Mm-hmm. So uh, at, from there, Lobo flies to Earth, and uh, we get a little fisticuffs for, in part <laughs> one there, which makes up the majority of part one. Yeah, it's interesting. They kind of stretch this fight between Lobo and Superman out throughout most of the episode. As you mentioned, we have a few minutes at the start to establish that Superman now has the ability to kind of fly into deep space in his rocket. And then you have the little introduction of who Lobo is as a character. And then, yeah, we're kind of off to the races of him uh, basically wrecking downtown Metropolis in order to get Superman's attention. And then (laughs) it's a lot of punching. It's a lot of, uh, Back and forth. I do like it, though, because it they very uh, early on there established sort of the dynamic between them. Um, and and there's there's a part where uh, Lobo fires this giant rocket out of his uh, his motorcycle and uh, Superman, has, of course, you know, flies to stop it and in order to keep it from from, you know, blowing up several civilians. And, and that sort of puts a, a light bulb off in Lobo's head that he can kind of get to Superman through attacking civilians and uh of course we get we get a little bit of (laughs) lobo interacting with lois which is great i'm sure we'll talk about that more later in in voice acting but uh and then yeah they're sort of the end of part one is lobo finally captures him and after a a brief battle in space and this is another one that has uh, several clips from this episode make it into the the opening uh theme song title sequence of the show um, so that's, that's certainly very memorable in that way. And then, yeah, for, for all of part two, once they're captured, of course, Lobo is immediately double crossed by the preserver who, uh, takes him as well, because we find out Lobo is the last Zarnian, uh, as, <laughs> as, 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 as he in fact blew up his own planet. Yeah. And then from there in part two, we have a kind of an extended escape sequence. We get some. Uh, fun little homages to, uh, I think, a couple different alien uh, movies that involve aliens, uh, uh, which, again, we'll certainly get more to in visuals, probably. But And uh, and Superman is able to escape, and uh, with the help of Lobo, we, we t- find out that the Preserver is actually this giant 
monstrous crab man. I, uh, I would I would describe him as a giant Glenn Mirakami drawing. That's oh man, especially and we'll get to this in visual. <laughs> yeah. Like especially the face. Yeah. Is absolutely. straight out of the Teen Titans show. Absolutely. Like, it's, but uh, yeah, we'll get to more. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's the funny thing talking about plot because there isn't a lot like it's all very simple it was all pretty much covered in the the imdb synopses but part one they punch each other and then part two they punch some robots and these other bounty hunters that are trying to get after lobo and and superman and well that i was gonna say the the subplot of of lobo trying to capture this weird alien creature that has an face on his mouth or mouth on his eye like i i don't know like his eye is also a mouth yeah but he also has a mouth like trying to capture this character and the other three bounty hunters who i'm if i'm not mistaken also appear maybe in comfort and joy they looked they looked very familiar maybe in definitely the guy with the ponytail does i don't possibly in darkest night or world world probably yeah those those are character models that are definitely reused Mm -hmm. the bounty hunters Uh, sorry again talking about visuals but anyway uh the subplot of of lobo and the bounty hunters i i had forgotten it, it, like at t- at times it, to me it dragged it down a little bit especially in part two it seems like a very strange detour because the the bounty hunters that are after lobo arrive on the collector ship uh to collect lobo and he sends them after superman and lobo and but they're also they still have the the little squirrel guy that they're trying to go after too and he's like he's Lobo has to pick him up first. It, it seemed a little bit disjointed and sort of out of place and out of left field. Um, but then I, I, I kind of like looking at it and knowing. So we, I think we mentioned Paul Dini wrote both of these. Mm-hmm. Um, so recognizing that I, I could see this in my mind as a comic book written by Paul Dini. Like I could see it play out it, like yes. Mad Love almost where this would be this like the B story in the comic book. And but it sort of fits into the A story for good reason. Um, so I, I gave it some grace to that. But there were some times where I it felt like that subplot came out of nowhere, took a left turn, took over the main plot and sort of dragged down just slightly for me. Yeah. And there's, like it's just like uh, one of the bounty hunters is the big brother of Squeak, the little squirrel guy that Lobo's trying to capture. And yeah, there's this sort of job of the hut esque character that's uh, hired them. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's all funny and quirky and like in another episode, I think it maybe would have fit better. Um, or if that was the central plot that, that brought him and Superman, Lobo and Superman into conflict somehow, like the squirrel thing was hiding out on earth or something. Maybe that would have been, but, but kind of shoehorning that in along with this idea of the, the collector and or the preserver and the inter- intergalactic zoo, uh, which is a cool wrinkle to it. Obviously, at the end, once once the preserver is is sent out into the de- depths of space, uh, you know Lobo gets his reward and Superman takes all of the animals and and creates his intergalactic zoo, uh, which is kind of a cool wrinkle because obviously that's like an old classic Superman thing, right? Um, that, that he just kind of has. <laughs> Right. I think that's like that like goes back to like the kind of the fifties golden age Superman. He you know, he would just have these things. Right. And it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be addressed exactly where they came from. So I thought it was cool to kind of give uh uh the Fortress of Solitude a little bit more of a they kind of build that out throughout the series between Yeah. It plays um, it it plays yeah, plays into into at least several other episodes and as you as you alluded to in the in the uh, opening, even additional series that it's in, it played out into, including one of the episodes we just covered not too long ago, last month with the Justice League for the man who has everything. Yeah, absolutely. That, that yeah, that a lot of these same character or uh, you know creature designs are seen in in that fight between Superman and uh, in Mongol in in the Fortress of Solitude. And yeah, I, I like how throughout this, especially it seems like in this first season, from you know him taking the the orb from Brainiac ship to the Phantom Zone projector to some of the stuff from his ship, and and then obviously now the Intergalactic Zoo. I think that's kind of a cool idea of allowing him to have all of this classic Superman stuff, but kind of building in a reason for him to have it. I think is clever. So, yeah, even though I I, I yeah, so I kind of went back and forth on plot because one, it is so basic. 
Um, but it is it is very fun. So I kind of settled on a, a little bit over middle of the road, I guess. I gave it a, a 7 out of 10. Okay. Uh, I went just a tick higher. I went 8 out of 10 for it. Um, I think even though that subplot dr- subplot drags a little bit, I think ultimately the payoff is really great. And that leads mm. to Superman tricking this group of bounty hunters into throwing yeah. him into the dodo cage where he just stands there. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, again, I'm getting ahead here, but stands <laughs> there underneath the sun lamp. And that, that culmination of it is, uh, this is awesome. And they needed, a, they needed an explanation as to how Superman got his full powers back. And that was a, that was a unique and interesting way to do that. So um, I gave it, ended up giving plot an eight out of 10. So um, not perfect by any means. Um, there were times and I, and I'm sure, we can talk about this also during visuals but there were times where it felt like we had jumped uh universes and gone into the looney tunes universe um (laughs) including you know scenes where lobo eats a metal bar uh hole um or when you know something blows up in his face and his hair blows back and you know his face is dark and it's it's like am i watching a you know a, a Roadrunner Wiley Coyote yeah. cartoon here, or am I watching Superman? But uh, I, again, I think that speaks to the the, the somewhat goofy nature, uh, with all due re- respectfully, the goofy nature of the writing of of Paul Dini. So um, yeah, not perfect, but still a lot of fun for for this episode. All right, let's move on now. As we've I've been just chomping at the bit to talk about, <laughs> it's, I'm talking about animation and visuals here, Liam. Um, I would say uh, to kick it off, we have we have an interesting cameo in the very first scene, and that would be uh, the scene that we talked about as Star Labs is is testing out Superman's uh, that ship and the the modifications that they made to it. We get a uh, we get a cameo appearance from Doctor Long from Nothing to Fear. He's one of the professors, I guess, or the, on the team working with Dr. Hamilton uh, on the uh, Star Labs team. Yeah, and it's funny because I think we saw him in the it's the Booster Gold episode of JLU. He's like one of the doctors running out of Star Labs. So I guess it's just I guess that that tracks then. Sometime he I guess quit his teaching job at, at Gotham University <laughs> and and became a professor or a doctor or a scientist researcher of some kind over at uh, at Star Labs. I, I I mean the good news is we don't have to worry about this. The the Watchtower <laughs> guys are the ones coming up with the like the histories and the timeline for all these characters. So yeah. explain that one when he got his job at Star Labs. This is might be the first first step to to seeing where do, the Doctor Long character moves along. But <laughs> uh, yeah, from there we have a lot. I mean, there's a lot of visual stuff that I thought were great in this. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly the um, <laughs> The uh, the different alien designs that we talked about, a lot of them have been, were again reused later on uh, in various different different shows and episodes. Um, we have uh, also in that very first scene, I thought it was thought visually it was cool to start off with Professor Hamilton looking through these pair of binoculars, and you get a reflection of what he's mm-hmm. looking at out into the distance. Just something small and and something that you probably wouldn't see. And that that also being animated as he's looking at it. So this this it's an animated reflection off of these binoculars, something that you may not see in another cartoon. Very easy just to make it a, a general glass colored or glass, you know, textured item there. But to have an actual reflection of what was going on, I thought was really, really great. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the Looney Tune esque uh, stuff that happens <laughs> in the first episode, uh, certainly the 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 stuff blowing up in in Lobo's face, where he drags uh, Superman drags him along this dock, and he sort of leaves a, a Lobo shaped imprint on the dock. A lot of very interesting visuals here. Lobo himself is also a very expressive character, makes a lot mm-hmm. of Mm-hmm. Uh, eyebrow raises uh, his eyes get smaller his eyes get bigger um, a, a little freakazoid-esque at times i would say yes um but yeah well, what course, are your thoughts? if what, you know the origins that? of that of that show of the freakazoid show bruce tim designed that character right even though he didn't end up doing much work on the actual show by the time it got to television he was actually uh, prior to superman the animated series he did actually do uh, at least some of the character designs and and uh 
initial work on that show. So yeah, that tracks. Absolutely. Uh, what about you? What, what, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff. There were a couple of visual, uh, Easter eggs, certainly at the, uh, at the, the collector on the collector ship. There was, I believe a, a starship enterprise, a star Trek mm-hmm. lookalike ship. There was a, uh, actually an ode to what I believe, uh, the 89 Batman bat plane looked to be in the hangar there yes. also the painted green. Um, yes. Superman and then, takes it up and throws it at the, uh, the preserver. Absolutely. Um, but of course, you know, we'd be remiss where we were kind of dancing all around it here. But one of the one of the biggest visuals came from that uh, intergalactic zoo. There's a specific alien that pops up that is a that plays a large role in a future series. Yeah, um, it's in fact the first uh, canonical DCAU appearance of Starro the Conqueror. Um this it's sort of this classic. It's the first Justice League villain ever in uh, whatever issue of Brave and the Bold it is that the Justice League first appears. They're fighting this giant starfish, and uh, it was it was at the time obviously it seemed like it was just this fun little visual gag, something to throw in there. Um, but obviously it was later taken and turned into sort of the uh, uh, the main plot of a of a Batman Beyond episode, a Batman Beyond episode where. In the real world timeline, the first time we ever got to see a Justice League in action was in the Batman Beyond episodes, The Call, which, of course, we haven't reviewed yet. But uh, in that episode, obviously, it it turns out that Starro is behind some of the strange goings on in that episode. And they even tie back and show a little flashback to this episode. So, yeah, it's it's funny how this this one little throwaway cameo ends up becoming this (laughs) this big linchpin for kind of. Again, in, in the real world, what was our introduction to uh, a Justice League in this universe? When we cover that episode, it'll be cool to look back and say, "Hey, yeah, that's uh, you know." I think they literally show a shot for shot of the of the mm-hmm. uh, of the final battle, from my recollection. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a, that's a big one that that flies out there. One one like specific visual that I thought was really awesome during that final fight uh, with the collector where, you know, he's transformed into this walking Glenn Murakami uh, <laughs> drawing, uh, which do you want to speak on that for a minute? Just like it's, I mean, it's that guy, if there's, if that guy can draw anything, it's definitely alien, grotesque alien creature. <laughs> yeah. He is uh, obviously just an insanely talented uh, artist and, and went on to be a great, uh, producer and showrunner in in his own right and yeah here it's as soon as it uh, you know and I remember uh, years ago uh, when the when the DVDs first came out I believe they do commentary on part two of this episode and as soon as as soon as the this giant red angry you know monster comes bursting out of this tiny little egg man uh, I just remember everyone going yep that's a Glenn design that's <laughs> that's kind of iconic. and again it, it's it's just it looks like it could have walked right out of uh, right, it could, it could walk right on, you know, sight unseen. You know, we, we talk about the visual differences between like the Teen Titan show and this classic DCAU style of animation. And like this, this guy could have walked right between the shows and wouldn't have looked out of place on either one of them. And uh, yeah, I, I love the design. It's just this big hulking red thing with these big white claws and this ugly kind of distorted face with these jagged teeth and, and these weird eyes. Like it's, it's really, really a striking design. It really, especially I think if you if you happen to be watching this for the first time, it really comes out of nowhere. Because even in, in part one, when Lobo kind of is first taken uh, prisoner, when the, the preserver tells him he wants him to catch Superman, Lobo tries to attack him. And there's some kind of like blue force field around around the preserver. So you think he's kind of going to be like an, you know, an emperor Palpatine type, you know, he's going to use like, you know, magic or energy or whatever. He's some higher evolved being. And it's like, nope, he's just, it turns out inside of this little egg is just this giant angry red crab man thing <laughs> uh, that's going to just beat the crap out of Lobo and Superman. It's like, what a, what a weird and crazy design, but it totally works. Yeah, it it really does. It fits really well. It I mean, the whole episode is not one that makes a whole lot of sense if you if you think too hard about it <laughs> in certain places. So for this to be living inside of this, you know, preserver character, this little tiny Eggman makes no sense. Like 
there's no way like physics say that does that can't fit that <laughs> way like that that don't fit that way um but it does because it's a cartoon and it and it's a fun little final battle there but there's a there's a spot during that battle where he actually slams superman through the floor of his ship and you mm-hmm. see superman kind of in this he looks down into the into the hole in the floor and you see Superman in the shade in the dark. And then he, Superman, tr- you know, comes out flying uh, to attack him at that point. I thought that was a great visual, great transition there. Uh, just, just a, just a very cool looking spot. Like you could see that in a, in a comic book um, jumping backwards, going back to the, to part one, the battle between Lobo and Superman as they're, they're going through Metropolis uh, as you mentioned, there's some interaction between Lobo and and Lois at this point, but Superman launches uh, uh, Lobo through LexCorp, uh, for, through the LexCorp tower, which is to much hilarity as Lex is on, on a uh, conference call with the president of the United States, or what sounds like the president, and uh, yeah. it just leads to some hilarity, and, and very, again, Looney Tunes-esque, as his cleaning crew is cleaning up from the first hole put in this, in the through the bottom of the floor, up through the ceiling, they come through back the other way, creating more of a mess in a very, like, Three Stooges or Looney Tunes type type visual gag but uh really a lot of fun to be had visually in this episode oh yeah no doubt about that i mean some of the designs are really creative we talked about the the two uh robotic for back of a better term robotic prostitutes that, uh, <laughs> that, that lobo has in his his little cell there that whenever he tries to break out their mouths just unhinge in this really creepy unnatural way and they have these uh, you know, like gas nozzles inside their mouths that uh, I love. that's really creative. Some of the uh, the visuals when the bounty hunters are fighting and uh, are fighting Superman and Lobo in, in the uh, sort of sort of like a jungle motif. It, it came off to me very much like it was referencing uh, the movie Predator. Um, there's a shot where Superman and Lobo kind of look up and you see the three bounty hunters kind of perched in the trees and mm-hmm. then there's a, a shot later where Superman, who's still kind of his powers are still not quite uh, quite up to snuff yet. He hasn't gone to the yellow sun yet. And he kind of uses his X-ray vision. You just see a silhouette of them sort of breaking off to try to surround Lobo and, and Superman. And then one of the ones that we actually haven't talked about yet is uh, at one point when they're kind of walking through the, the zoo, they fall into this pit and they fight this giant snake. Um, and this has to be one of the like more violent things I've ever seen on one of these cartoons, just Superman's kind of struggling with it in a sort of classic Superman versus giant animal way. He's kind of standing in the mouth of the creature, trying to hold the teeth open. And then Lobo just grabs the snake by the tail and rips all of its skin off. (laughs) And you just see like this red, like these red, like bumps and veins and like all of the, you know, all of like the fresh skin underneath this, this, you know, this pink grotesque looking thing. And the snake sort of skitters away, makes this terrible sound and then dives back into this, the sand. Like there's, I think that might be one of the more violent single acts we've ever seen in a DCAU cartoon. Yeah. I, they got away with it, I guess, because the creature isn't dead. It just sort of dives back into whatever sand it gr- came out of, but yeah. it's, it's, it's gross. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty wild. They uh they came up with just some some wild uh, wild visuals and I, yeah, I like some of the designs. The weird like six legged rhino that Superman uh, <laughs> taunts into uh, breaking him out of his cell. Uh, I thought was was a cool looking design and even the the fun little visual gag of uh, when Superman's first in the uh, the preservers uh, zoo. He, the preserver has put him in in what is basically Jarrell's suit from Last Son of Krypton Part One. Yeah, um, he's in the the red and the red and black and gray uh, Kryptonian garb, which I thought was kind of clever because we'd never really seen Superman and in, in, or Clark in that look before. So, yeah, just all around, uh, so many great visuals, and uh, I gave this one a ten out of ten. Nice. Yeah, it's uh, I gave it a nine out of ten. There were a few spots in that opening scene where characters looked a little bit off model. There was uh, the scene where Lois gets out of the 
out of the taxi cab, there was some like depth perception issues where she was sort of out of scale from the car that like, again, that's nitpicking. It's what we do on the program. If you haven't heard an episode before, (laughs) it's kind of what we do. Uh, so I, I had to, because I was, I was forced to notice those things. I sort of took it down just a notch, but it's, it's very strong. Um, yeah, nine out of 10 for me. All right, Liam, let's move on to music. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not just going to say the same thing I say every week. So uh, this is another episode that is not on, available to stream or listen to uh, without the uh, voice acting or sound effects in the background, which is which is really, really sad because the music in this episode is so unique and so different than what we're used to. Uh, the music in this episode stands out from the get-go. There's uh, there's guitar and drums, and even throughout the entire episode, I noticed that the Superman theme, each time it's played, traditionally, um, you have a more orchestral drum drumming that's mm-hmm. happening with it. This one has a full drum kit with cymbals and snare and all of that. Um, it, so it incorporates the rock feel into the Superman theme uh, during the entire episode, giving this this episode itself, while familiar, uh, it gives it its own unique sound. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we, we talked about this a little bit last week, um, but uh, the, the talent that goes into sort of laying that Superman theme uh and have, allowing it to mix with with the music of the rest of the episode. I thought this was another great example of that. And once again, I believe the composer for this episode was Hardy Cohen. And uh, yeah, it's uh, just the cutting back and forth, I think, especially in part one, where, uh, where Lobo has started to attack the, the police station. He's kind of making a wreck of downtown. And you have shots of Superman leaving the Daily Planet, and you're you're playing the traditional Superman theme, and then it cuts back to Lobo, and he's shooting, trying to shoot a mosquito or whatever, and as you get the rock music, and then it cuts back to Superman and that music, and then the themes sort of start to lay on top of each other and combine, and just that way of where they're as they're apart, the, mu- the music is very separate, and then as they get closer together and then come into direct com- conflict, kind of whichever character has the upper hand in, in that fight. You hear more of the electric, you know, the electric guitar driven, you know, the Lobo theme. And then when Superman kind of takes back the upper hand or is, is uh, doing something more heroic, then the Superman theme cuts back in. And yeah, I think especially in part one, the music uh, and the way it sort of goes back and forth between sort of our more traditional orchestral DCAU feel and that hard rock uh, is really, really impressive. Yeah, and like I said, it would be awesome, um, and certainly probably we'd be able to appreciate a little bit more sort of the nuances and and the various different uh, variations of the Lobo theme, and and certainly those combined efforts where they're going back and forth, or they're layering the the Superman theme on top of the the Lobo theme. Um, So it would be really great to do that. We don't have that option, uh, (laughs) but it it does stand out enough. It is one of those episodes where undoubtedly you cannot watch it and not not notice the music um and that's that's a good thing it's a great thing we talk about that a lot on these episodes where you know the music just kind of blends in the background and that's not necessarily a bad thing it's just it it wasn't needed for that episode or it isn't the focal point and it a lot of times it can set set the mood for the episode it can certainly bring more excitement and it and it definitely sets the character of lobo apart because we you know we don't get another appearance from him in superman for my recollection i believe um, he has a cameo at the end of the maxima episode uh, oh you're the, right he does but not, he does not okay you're right appearance. Right, but when when he does make his return, certainly in in Justice League, it sets the tone for this character, and it, you know he's not only this interesting, fun, funny-looking character. His mm-hmm. vocals are unique, which we'll talk about in just a second. But he's a full character, and then he gets his own theme, his own music style, and it carries throughout the entire episode. So, uh, not not every DCAU character, villain, or antagonist uh, can can sort of claim that and Lobo does and it's awesome and it's why I gave music a perfect 10 out of 10 for this episode 
Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm actually right at that exact same score. I gave it a 10 out of 10. Uh, yeah, just for all the reasons we mentioned, I think it's it's so uh, it's such a cool idea. And again, later on, electric guitars became a lot more prevalent with with Batman Beyond and certainly with Justice League Unlimited. But uh, here here early on in this run of Superman cartoons, it's still very very. Uh, unique and really stands out. And like I said, the way they were able to kind of layer in the traditional orchestral DCAU music with with this hard rock theme, it just it works really well. Absolutely. All right, Liam, let us move on to our final category of the day, which is going to be voice acting. As we alluded there, we have a lot of familiar names. There was a couple of names that I was surprised to read as uh, s- some surprise vocal appearances. Uh, one being their first appearance actually in the DCAU going on later on to voice a very iconic villain in another series and a couple of other returning favorites. Uh, let's talk about our voice cast today. Yeah, we have a, a pretty... Uh, not a huge cast to talk about, but there are some notable ones to talk about. Um, we have Richard Maul as the Jabba the Hutt-esque uh, Emperor's Luge, um, who, of course, played Two-Face in Batman and, and the new Batman Adventures. Um, always fun to see a, a DCAU veteran get to come back and, and play a different role. We have... Uh, as you mentioned, Cal, a, a guy who would go on to play a very important villain in a later series. We have Sherman Howard, who, of course, played Blight in, uh, in Batman Beyond and actually originally auditioned for Lex Luthor. And I believe uh, the creators have said he was pretty close. He was on that short list before, before Clancy Brown came in and just killed it. Um, <laughs> so it, it's funny to hear him because they do put some sort of a uh, voice effect on uh, – on the uh, on the preserver character, both when he's the Eggman and then at the end when he uh, becomes the giant monster, there's kind of effects on it. So it's not immediately clear because uh, Sherman Howard has a pretty uh, distinct, recognizable voice. But uh, yeah, I, until I was really doing doing the research for the episode, I didn't necessarily remember that he was uh, he was the voice there. But yeah, I like between between his performance and the effects they put on it, I I think he does a good job as this sort of weird you know this this weird uh, zookeeper i guess huh? this can't be krypton no but an incredible simulation let me guess you're the one who hired lobo to get me i do what i must to preserve species threatened with extinction you are the last kryptonian Therefore, your place is here. I think not! Like Krypton's red sun, this light cancels the unnatural abilities given to you by the yellow sun of Earth. I always strive for complete accuracy. Swell. Yeah, he's, he's required to play an alien. I mean, there's not... He he's a cold alien. He doesn't really, you know, evoke much much emotion. The emotion that he does get to evoke at the end is sort of covered up by his, you know, voice modulation. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's not a not a very difficult performance, I would say. Uh, but of course, this this ultimately, I'm sure, would lead to them recasting him later on, you know, in, in such a pivotal role in that first season of Batman Beyond. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we have some of our regulars. We have, as you mentioned, in a brief but very funny spot, we have Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor. We have uh, Lois Lane and, uh, uh, of course, Dan Delaney playing her, and which is great because, again, she has that sort of minor moment with Lobo, which is funny and, and good and true to the Lois Lane character. But there's also this great scene right at the start of the episode where Lois is talking to Clark and and he and she asks him how he's kind of always getting these great scoops and everything and and Clark uh, proceeds to tell her the truth. <laughs> I'm confused, Ken. See, I've lived in Metropolis most of my life and I can't figure out how some yokel from Smallville is suddenly getting every hot story in town. Well, Lois, the truth is, I'm actually Superman in disguise, and I only pretend to be a journalist in order to hear about disasters as they happen and then squeeze you out of the byline. You're a sick man, Kent. You asked. 
Yeah, that that was awesome. I wrote that one down too. I thought that that was so witty and so funny, and her response is just one of dismissal. And it's funny because in the scene, even his glasses are like hanging off of his nose, mm-hmm. like his glasses aren't even pushed up all the way, and she's just so dis- ah, whatever, whatever, Kent. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> so dismissive of it. It's so great. Yeah, I love that scene, and yeah, I think I think Tim Daly is good here. And again, this is still semi early in the production order of the show so he's certainly not maybe firing on all cylinders but i think playing him off of lobo giving him somebody because they kind of make a big point of that in part one that that uh, he like lobo really gets under superman's skin in a way that maybe not every villain he's fought to this point has so he gets to i think tim daly gets to kind of stretch his legs a little bit and show a little bit more of the, like we don't we don't get necessarily get pissed off superman every episode so I think you got to show a little bit more there. Right. Um, yeah, there's a and, good there's a good there's a good juxtaposition between the Superman. It's very serious, no nonsense. And of course, he's playing off of this cartoon character who literally <laughs> is I mean, he's he, it's it's like Deadpool before Deadpool was a character. He breaks the fourth wall in certain ways. He, you know, speaks about things, you know, mentions pop culture references. He mentions 31 flavors of butt whooping in one, 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 uh, one quip he has a lot mm-hmm. of quips going on there. So yeah, you're, you're playing, he's playing the straight man in this, in this episode. And that's something that Tim Daly, I feel like can do in his sleep. Absolutely. And then yes, the, the main event here of our voice acting section will of course be the, the debut appearance of Brad Garrett as Lobo. And this is like, man, um, I mean, we, we've hundreds of times, and I'm sure we will a hundred times more, uh, praise uh, the ability and uh, the great the great work that Andrea Romano does as as uh, did as the voice director and and uh, cat and voice ca- uh, caster on all of these shows. And my goodness, is Brad Garrett the schlubby loser brother from Everybody Loves Raymond? Uh, like, he, you know, he plays this kind of sad sack, sarcastic character on that show. Uh, it was probably his most famous role. You wouldn't necessarily immediately think he is the perfect Lobo. But from the second you hear that voice coming out of it, you're like, oh, th- no one else should ever play Lobo again as long as he's alive. Like, he's so yeah. perfect for this role. <laughs> I'm giving you geeks 10 seconds before I frag everything in sight. One, ten. Hey, how's it going, Chief? Uh, maybe you can help me. I'm new in town, and I'm looking to find this geek here. Superman? We don't keep tabs on him. He only shows up if there's trouble. I can do trouble. Oh, this is getting late. I thought he'd be here by now. Whoa, mosquito! Time to up the ante, I'm thinking. Finally, I've been trying to get in touch with you all day. Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. My card. The name's Lobo. That's L as in lacerate, O as in obliterate, B as in disembowel, and O as in, uh... Oh, I guess I can use obliterate twice, huh? What do you think? I think you're a certifiable madman. Huh? Oh, thanks. Now, the more you move, the worse it'll hurt. So, feel free to go crazy. Excuse me? Leave him alone. Go on, get out of here. Well, little lady, hello. Why don't you show old Lobo how classy you are? You pig! Ow! Ah, I like a baby plays rough. Come on, let me have another. Right here, right here. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, I was conversing with somebody on Instagram this week. Uh, you know, we posted our preview clip. Uh, follow us on Instagram, by the way, at DCAU Review. Uh, I was talking with somebody there, and they mentioned just to them, you know, another one of those voices that when you're reading a, a comic book or, you know, you have the opportunity to 
to read something with Lobo in it that you're going to hear Brad Garrett's voice playing him. But on top mm-hmm. of it, just hearing hearing his voice and, like you said, saying just like Kevin Con- Conroy is Batman, Lobo obviously nowhere near as popular as Batman or Superman or you know Wonder Woman even. But we're we're talking here about a, a character who's sort of you know, second, third tier, probably maybe fourth tier in the DC uh, mm-hmm. universe. But w- to have a, a, an actor like Brad Garrett come in, just absolutely kill his performance and, and make it so legendary. It's like, yeah. And then they bring him back later on as we've already, you know, covered in hereafter for, uh, you know, another appearance in, in justice league. And, you know, he, he's just so great. Everything about that character fits with that voice uh, just the perfect, perfect casting. I think we've we've sung her praises a lot and deservedly so. But yeah, Andrea, Andrea Romano, boy does she know how to cast a voice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like and some of the stuff they get him to do, like as you mentioned, obviously in the comics he's a very foul mouthed, you know, you know, character that swears a lot. And obviously they couldn't have him do any actual cursing. So he has this like again very much like a Looney Tunes or something. He has this like made up language that he curses in. In fact, one, the the best one, again, as we mentioned, is the scene where, you know, Superman and Lobo crash through one side of LexCorp and then they're down on the ground fighting. Superman kicks him and Lobo goes flying. And, he, and as he's flying away, he's cursing at him. And he, as he, cra- you know, you hear the build, you hear the, him crash through the building, you hear him cursing and then he crashes through the other side of it. It's so funny. And he, he is, just so great of it. And, it, and it's like in a lot of these lines, again, as you mentioned, this because this character was sort of created as a parody of a, of a comic book character, as you mentioned, kind of all of his lines are one liners or quips like for, and again, you could give a lot of actors and a lot of characters a line like I'm the manager at the Hotel de Frag. And I don't know that it, <laughs> I don't know that a lot of them could have pulled it off, and I don't think any of them could have pulled it off as well as Brad Garrett does. And yeah, it's just it's just this picture perfect uh, casting, as you mentioned it. It goes with the music that they gave him. It goes with the with the design of the character, how well this Lobo character has fit into the DCAU uh, look. And uh, yeah, and, and then the the icing on the cake, the cherry on top, is the uh, is is Brad Garris' performance here because he is phenomenal. I think my favorite line from him in the whole episode is when he yells at Superman, "Hands off my hog." <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was yeah. one of those things where I was like, did I just hear him say that? Yep. There's I that, and he promises to kick Superman's big red S all yeah. over the, the galaxy. So, yeah, they, again, they, they couldn't have him say anything too naughty, but they uh, they, they, got they got away with a few. Yeah, they got pretty inventive and, and figured out a way to be to be tongue-in-cheek and be a little cheeky, as they say, across the pond. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, just fantastic. I, I don't know how how you couldn't, and I, I will I will fight you and argue with you if you didn't give this a 10 out of 10, because I'm giving this a 10 out of 10. <laughs> well, not to worry. I, uh, I also gave it a 10 out of 10. I think even if... Even if everyone else was just awful in this episode, which, again, they aren't, um, yep. it would be hard for me to not give this at a 10 because, again, so much of the episode is Brad Garrett's Lobo. And, again, I, I love the way he and Tim Daly play off of each other. Um, we've talked a lot about how the you know, the advantage of these cartoons versus a lot of traditional animation is that a lot of times the actors were able to record together. And uh, you can kind of just tell the difference and right. in, in, in how they can play off each other and act with each other rather than just kind of reading lines in a in a little recording booth. So, yeah, it's yeah, just just tremendous job for for Brad Garrett, especially. And, and again, his his back and forth with with Tim Daly. I think this is a, an easy 10 for for voice acting this week. Absolutely. Um you know, jumping ahead here, but yeah, you know, if you had any doubts that you should watch this episode, <laughs> you know, if you just want to hear a tremendously funny and great performance, uh, and you have 44 minutes, uh, yeah, you need to watch this episode. But anyway, let's, uh, that'll bring us to our final scores, Liam, uh, totaling everything up. I have a final score of 37 out of 40. What about you? <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? I have the you know? exact same score. Of 37. Top pick for both of, of us, baby. 
Yes, That's right. absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, I don't think we really need to question it. Between this great debut of this this fun, uh, you know, again, Lobo certainly something of a time capsule of a certain era of comics. Mm-hmm, but, uh, for sure, you know, hold, holds a special place in our heart. As we said, we you know we we had a little bit of an introduction when we were pretty young, and then seeing him in this show as well, and obviously he comes back later on. And as we mentioned, this this episode also has implications for for Batman Beyond down the line. So. Yeah, this is a this is a two thumbs up as far as rewatchability goes. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it like like we said, it, there are parts maybe in the plot that drag a little bit or that you know aren't aren't great, but uh, you know it it evens out. Everything works together, and it's uh, it's a really really strong episode, one of the strongest Superman episodes to date. So, uh, absolutely loved it. So. Yeah, Liam, that will wrap us up for this week. Thank you, everybody, for checking us out. As we always say, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting app. Heck, subscribe to them on all your podcast apps. If you got multiple podcast apps, subscribe to on all of them. If there's an option to leave a review, we would love you to do that. Leave a five-star review. Give us some feedback. Uh, it helps us out immensely. Not only gives us a, a direction to pull the show into, but also gives uh, gives people out there that haven't heard us the opportunity to listen as well. Uh, don't forget also follow us as we mentioned on Instagram at DCAU Review. Follow Liam on Twitter at DCAU Review as well. Tweeting stuff all day, every day over there. The latest hip and happenings in the DCAU, uh, plus kind of regular DC Comics stuff. Uh, always always fun to talk about over there. Don't forget to check out the archives at dcaureview.com you can check out that episode hereafter uh, where we already discussed where Lobo comes back and fills in for Superman uh, in the Justice League or uh, you know if you want to listen to Nothing to Fear and find out who Dr. Long is you can check that out (laughs) all that is available at dcaureview.com you can even break down as we mentioned this goes into our top picks section what is that you ask we have all of our episodes ranked 37 or higher all set together so if you only want to listen to the best of the best episodes that we've covered thus far go over and check out our top pick section liam we are somehow wrapping up the month of june next week with our final episode this month covering superman why don't you let the listeners at home uh, in on a little preview of what episode we'll be covering yeah i uh some uh, some eagle-eyed or Eagle eared, I guess. Uh, (laughs) uh, Listeners may have heard me make reference to it last week, but in fact, we will be wrapping up the month with the return of Lana Lang and the Toy Man in the episode Obsession. There we go. Uh, If you recall, we did review Fun and Games probably the last time we covered this series, maybe 40 some episodes ago, back in the 70s, I believe. Uh, We reviewed Fun and Games, and that was also in our top pick section. Very fun semi-dark episode uh, kind of re- reviving this toy man character that if, if you're not familiar with him or if you're only maybe familiar with the uh frightening version of him from the super friends uh you know go <laughs> back and go back and listen to that episode in the archives uh and get ready for this this week's episode because this also plays an important part in uh in another dcau show and uh some some fun and games or so to be had there so <laughs> All right. Well, that will wrap us up for this week. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Cal. And I'm Liam. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the DCAU Review. Adios.